for, uh, for coming to the event today, uh, which is our first focusing on uh, human rights in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I want to extend an initial thank you to, uh, well, first of all, I'm uh, Michael Payne. I'm the uh, International Advocacy Officer for Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain. Uh, we're glad to be uh, focusing on, uh, we, we certainly focus on issues beyond just Bahrain and uh, the other GCC states. Uh, and so we're happy to be focusing on the UAE this morning. Uh, we also want to thank our other co-sponsors of the event uh, this morning, uh, the Bahrain Institute for Rights and Democracy, the European Center for Democracy and Human Rights, uh, uh, index on censorship, and uh, I believe we have uh, AQRF uh, as well, which I can't read the small print on that one. Um, but thank you to all of our other co-sponsors uh, for joining us here in the event. Um, we will have uh, a few of our panelists have not been able to, to travel uh, to come to our event this morning, and so they will be uh, joining us via video messages, um, and we'll have those up on the screen here. Um, but as far as our panelists that are able to join us here in person uh, for this morning, we will also have uh, Mohammed al Aradi, who is a UAE businessman uh, uh, whose brother was, is de detained in the UAE. Uh, he will be speaking uh, as well as uh, Roy Donaghy, an independent journalist uh, who's worked quite a bit on uh, the UAE over the past several years. Um, and so uh, that will, we'll move on to the panel shortly, but I'd like to start by um, just introducing the event here, but before I do, I want to put uh, some initial uh, rules for the event here that we'd ask that everyone follow. Um, we'd ask that only accredited press are, are taking photos and videos throughout. Um, and we just want to, to make sure that that is, is, uh, uh, is adhered to. And then also, please uh, put your, any of your phones on either vibrate or silent. We don't want phones ringing throughout. And if you have to have a conversation, please take it outside too. We don't want to disrupt the event. So, um, As far as the event goes, uh, so throughout the 31st session of the Human Rights Council, we've heard extremely little about the domestic human rights environment in the, UI, in the United Arab Emirates. Almost no attention has been paid to what happens inside the country, with commentators instead focusing on the UAE's involvement in international coalitions and regional initiatives. This needs to change. Since 2011, the human rights environment inside the UAE has rapidly deteriorated. The UAE has passed new laws that seek to restrict the space for free expression in the country, and the criminal justice system has repeatedly failed uh, critical voices in the UAE. The government has misapplied terrorism and cyber crimes laws that target activists, and these laws have enabled it to silence its critics with impunity. The terrorism law, for example, which was passed in 2014, defines terrorism as opposing the country without intent or cause de uh, without intent to cause death or injury. Uh, it further prescribes the death penalty or life in prison for anyone who threatens the stability, safety, unity, sovereignty, or security of the UAE, as well as anyone who commits an act that prejudices national unity or publicly declares opposition to the state or its leadership. The law, uh, the law on combating cyber crimes, which was passed in 2012, similarly prescribes uh, imprisonment for anyone who anyone who publishes information that prompts sectarianism or damages national unity or social peace. The law prohibits the transmission of information, news, and images that could endanger national security and even offers punishment for those who publish information with the intent to damage the reputation or prestige of the state its institutions or its rulers. Finally, the law prescribes life imprisonment for publishing information that aims to change the ruling system or promote protests. The UAE has repeatedly used both the cyber crimes law and the terrorism law to, pub to punish activists who, for speaking out against the government. In the past several years, the government has arrested numerous activists for making critical comments on Twitter. In 2013, it tried 94 activists uh, before the state security court after they petitioned the government for political reforms. On 18 August 2015, the government arrested the actor, activist Dr. Nasser bin Raith after he posted a critical tweet. He, was, he, has not, uh, he has not been seen or heard from since. More and more activists have found themselves uh, with a tremendously restricted space within which to speak out. Uh, 
Within the criminal justice system, detainees in the UAE face repeated due process violations. Uh, detainees have reported that uh, have reported being subjected to arbitrary detention, incommunicado detention, enforced disappearance, torture, and limited access to legal representation. Since this, uh, this, these systematic abuses uh, in the criminal justice system all lead to a deteriorating human rights environment whereby flawed judicial processes are, enabled, uh, are enabling the government to silence free expression. Repressing, repression in the UAE is not talked about uh, like it is in other GCC countries. The UAE casts itself as a progressive modern nation in the Gulf and this image is largely reflected in the international media. Yet the state security apparatus's uh, uh, aggressive targeting of activists has contributed to an environment where UAE citizens are becoming too afraid to speak out. For this reason, the international community needs to begin a discussion about the human rights environment in the UAE, and we hope this, in, uh, this event will help further that discussion. Uh, so first off, uh, for our first panelists, we're going to be uh, viewing uh, indirectly uh, a presentation by Mr. Uh, Dr. Mads Andanias. Uh, Professor Mads Andanias uh, has recorded this message from All Souls College in, at the University of Oxford uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, he was the President Rapporteur of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention until July 2015. In his term, uh, the Working Group ruled against the UAE in several opinions and made clear that the mass arrests uh, followed a pattern. That pattern included enforced disappearances and torture. Uh, where there were con where there were convictions, uh, they were based on uh, they were based on uh, overbroad criminal provisions that made individuals criminally liable for exercising their right to political free speech and organization. The working group stated that the arbitrary detention practices were systematic and hence could constitute international, could constitute international crimes as crimes against humanity uh, that, uh, that could have serious consequences uh, for individuals involved. Uh, so with that, we're going to turn to Professor Ananias's video presentation. The United Arab Emirates have uh, carried out a large number of arbitrary detentions and forced disappearances. Many foreign nationals and Emirati citizens have been arrested and abducted by the state. The UAE government has um, not been open with uh, the international community and uh, it has not uh, provided uh, arguments uh, which could justify any of um, the uh, charges brought against it in the different cases that um, the different special human rights mandate holders and the working group on arbitrary detention has uh, brought to their attention. The um, uh, different cases um, are now many and there are clear patterns. They concern, in many instances, uh, peaceful protest. They um, are also often examples of the use of overbroad uh, criminal statutes uh, where legitimate forms of protest are seen as attempts to overthrow the government in a way which constitute uh, political crimes. In um, February uh, this year, uh, the um, uh, working group uh, made public uh, one of its uh, rulings um, which uh, concerned an, a number of foreign nationals which had, who had been arbitrarily detained for a year and a half and the working group called for their immediate uh, and unconditional um, release. Um, the um, arbitrary nature of the detention was uh, clearly um, uh, established in the conclusions of the working group and um, in statements uh, uh, by the um, 
uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Ron Mendes, um, a concern was raised um, about incommunicado secret detention and in solitary confinement, which reinforced the risk of being tortured or ill-treated. Uh, uh, the um, Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers, Monica Pinto, uh, underlined that the five men who were the subject of this ruling by the working group had not been able to challenge the lawfulness of the detention before court and they had had extremely limited access to their lawyers, their conversations had been monitored and the lawyers had had limited access to the client's files. And Monica Pinto made clear that there here was a breach of the due process guarantees enshrined in both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Arab Charter on, on Human Rights. The um, working group has a long line of cases. The, um, one of the most important cases against uh, the um, United Arab Emirates is the UAE 94 case uh, from 2013. And when it came to the working group making its um, uh, opinion, uh, making its ruling, um, there were 61 individuals uh, identified uh, who um, uh, had been <coughs> arbitrarily detained. And um, the uh, working group then already in um, 2013 stated that at this stage, this was the third opinion since 2009 adopted by the working group on uh, violations of uh, the rights to freedom of expression, a fair trial, and freedom from arbitrary detention in the United Arab Emirates. And it described this as a, pa uh, as a pattern. And <coughs> when the working group uses that language, it also uses the language of international crimes um, that you have an occurrence which is um, systematic. And if you have systematic arbitrary detention that uh, constitutes uh, a crime against uh, humanity if the other conditions are, are satisfied and of course uh, that is uh, 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 of extreme gravity when the working group makes such a statement um, and uh, directs it so specifically against an individual <coughs> country. The um, working group underlined that expressing criticism of one's country's authorities in a peaceful way should not be categorized as an attempt to overthrow um, a government. And uh, the working group stated that the restrictions of those rights in this case could not be considered to be proportionate uh, and justified, expressing um, uh, criticism again of one's country and its leaders, communicating with other political actors, says the working group, in a peaceful way should not be categorized as an attempt to overthrow a government. Um, we have, we all know, a system of supervision of human rights in the world which is incomplete and imperfect. What we have is a UN body in the Human Rights Council which has developed different forms of peer control, um, states control one another. Um, the Human Rights Commission and then the Human Rights Council appoints independent um, experts and uh, the point with these independent experts is of course that they should be independent of the international political process. They should be able to pursue human rights violations even when it's not politically um, convenient to do so and it should in a, a wide range of cases be, be in a position to assist 
the um, Human Rights Council in its work. The, the, the working group on arbitrary detention uh, makes rulings in individual um, cases. Uh, these are not advisory. You know, when the working group makes uh, a ruling in an opinion, it is uh, a statement about the human rights obligations of a country, of a state, and it makes findings both on the law and, and the facts. Um, it's a very uh, careful, many would say conservative body. Um, it uh, only makes uh, these findings after a rigorous procedure. And uh, in the case of the United Arab Emirates, there's no doubt that the state has not in any way showed a justification which possibly could justify the arbitrary detentions. Um, and the conclusions of the working group are very clear and they are unchallenged, in any substantive way unchallenged. Now, what does this mean? Well, uh, it means that the United Arab Emirates has uh, a duty to comply with these uh, opinions, uh, these rulings in these opinions. Um, and, and we see they do, they do release in some instances, but not at all. And uh, I'm convinced that they have not provided the compensation they have a duty to do and which then have been restated in the opinions of the working group. The case has only come up because NGOs and the wider civil society bring them to the attention of the working group of arbitrary detention of the special rapporteurs here in the UN system in Geneva. Um, it is uh, after these opinions have been rendered, it is for the <coughs> wider civil society and the NGOs to continue to put pressure on the country um, responsible for the violations, but also on other countries, so that they can exercise the peer pressure that the different mechanisms in the Human Rights Council allow them to, to do. And, and of course, um, to bring pressure uh, at home and in, in neighbour states. Uh, it is a very important role for the civil society in this, and uh, um, even if we can uh, agree that uh, these mechanisms are far from perfect, they are the mechanisms which we do have and which we are under a, a duty, a, a clear moral duty to do the most out of that we possibly, possibly can. And that's why um, this meeting uh, today is so important. It's part of that process. And um, the only thing I can do um, at the end of uh, my little intervention today is, is to, to wish you the, the very best of, of luck with your, with your work. Thank you to uh, Professor Andoneas, former uh, President of Repertory of the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, uh, for that uh, great video presentation, uh, since he was not able to join us here in Geneva for, for the event. Um, just a reminder, I see a lot of people have uh, come in late. Uh, where uh, Videos uh, for the event here are all uh, are only for accredited press, uh, are only allowed to take videos uh, and photos during the event. Um, there is a live stream right now of this uh, event. If you want to see video of it, uh, or if you're not here to, to watch it, uh, or if you want to share it with others, um, and that can be found, uh, uh, ADHRB's Twitter account has the, the link for the feed. So if you want to have video of this, uh, please go there, And but only accredited press um, are allowed for, for that. Um, Moving on from there, uh, we have uh, Mohammed El Aradi, uh, who is a UA uh, businessman who lived in the UAE for over two decades uh, before being arbitrarily detained in the UAE. He was released in December 2014. Mohammed is the brother of Salim Al Aradi, who currently still is detained in the UAE. Mohammed has been advocating for his brother for the last year. 
Um, you've heard that this is going to be Muhammad's first uh, public presentation in English, and so we're, we're very appreciative of him for being able, for his willingness to come and share his story here with us today. Um, and his remarks will also be joined by uh, just a short uh, infographic video uh, sort of highlighting his cases, uh, which was also produced by the Libyan Association for Victims of Torture and Enforced Disappearances in the UAE, um, which is an association of, uh, established by families of Libyan business businessmen, um, as well as, as, and well-known international cases um, of arbitrary detention in the UAE. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Mohammed. ADHRP for inviting me to speak today. My name is Mohammed El Aradi. I have come all this way to share an ordeal many Libyan families, including mine have had to go through for over 600 days. I am not just family of victim, but I was one of the victim and survive, sur, survivor of the UAE secret torture presence. In August 2014, 10 businessmen of Libyan origin disappeared after being, being kidnapped by UAE state security. I will forever be grateful to God that I was one of four people released. We waited, hoping that UAE government would fix my brother's situation. After many months, we realized that silence is not the answer. We could not leave my brother's fate in the hands of UAE state security. So, so we start a campaign in Canada to raise awareness of this, of his case, which today has become a global call for his freedom. Our family has never been an enemy or a critic of the UAE, a country we have come to love and respect. I must admit that for 23 years I lived in the UAE, and this have been the best years of my life, with the exception of the last 120 days where I went through a bitter experience. All we want is to bring Salim home. My brother Salim is a human right, have been violated as confirmed by United Nations, we got other United Nations mandates and human rights groups. We are simply sharing the reality. This week, the Abu Dhabi court made a verdict against two Libyans, Lib of Libyans, acquitting them of all charges brought forth by state security. This outcome has offered engorgement that UAE court has chosen in this case not to accept the state security action outside of the law. This verdict has given us hope for similar outcome in Salim's case. I know, I know for a fact that Salim simply wants his dignity and freedom back. When justice is given, to him and his free man once more. All wants is to rebuild his life with his children. We will not accept anything but real to process and just verdict. We are looking forward to have this campaign come to an end. UAE will still be a country we respect for the good years we spent there. All we are looking for is just verdict, which will help us close difficult chapter of our lives. Thanks. 2014, without charges, arrest, or search warrants. After 550 days, it is undisputed that these individuals are political hostages in the context of UAE hostile foreign policy and interference with Libyan affairs. The violation of their rights is no different than hundreds of reported cases of UAE state security's systemic approach for collecting intelligence through illegal arrest, search, detainment, interrogation, 
torture and deportation after bruises have healed. For months, the U.S. and Canadian governments escalated concerns about the arbitrary detainment and ill treatment of their citizens. On January 18, 2016, the state security prosecutor hastily charged the expats with supporting two Libyan groups alleging links to terrorism. But none of those groups appeared on any terrorist list, including the UAEs. All defendants pleaded not guilty. None have had access to a lawyer before the trial. Lawyers were only given the case file two weeks after the trial began. They discovered the alleged activities have no relation to the UAE, and the case is based on confessions coerced during the expats' torture. Based on the UAE constitution and international law, the accusations invoked a law that did not exist at the time of the alleged incidents, and was put into force days after the arrest, therefore cannot be applied retroactively. The UAE Penal Code states, no criminal action shall be instituted against a person who commits a crime in a foreign country except by the public prosecutor. This never took place. International lawyers and UN experts have stated the UAE judiciary has no jurisdiction to prosecute activities abroad. In February 2016, the UN released an opinion concluding the detainment was arbitrary, victims tortured, and that it was impossible for them to receive a fair trial. The UN called on the UAE to release and compensate them. The results of the court-ordered forensic assessment, with no judicial process interference by UAE state security, is a litmus test of fair trial standards. The UAE state security rattled the judicial system by taking action outside of the law against foreigners and filing charges for which no law exists. UAE state security has conceived baseless terrorism charges and claims due process. But is a closed door trial with no right of appeal following an illegal lengthy arbitrary detainment, torture, and no legal counsel due process? The only fair legal outcome is a dismissal of this case. Can we expect a judiciary to stand for justice and not succumb to state security intervention? Though I cannot be there physically due to my travel ban, I'll be sharing with you part of my personal experience as a human rights defender working in the United Arab Emirates. Starting in 2009, myself and other intellectuals from UAE established an online discussion forum. The forum allowed a very high ceiling of freedom of expression allowed people to post political comments, social comments, religious comments, and cultural comments, and any other types of comments uh, without really, uh, you know, uh, labeling people or defaming people. We were strict on not allowing that. Uh, the site, actually part of the site, was blocked three months after the launch of the site and the complete site uh, was blocked six months after that. In 2011, I'm going over the major uh, things that happened since then. I wouldn't be going over the uh, tiny tiny details for the interest of time. In March 2011, uh, I initiated along with uh, other UA citizens a petition that became widely known afterward as the 3rd of March petition calling for political reform in the country. It was, it was nicely written in a very friendly language requesting the president of the country to allow the members of the parliament to be elected by the means of the universal suffrage and grant the parliament the legislative and regulatory powers as it is, as it is a consultative body at that time and remains. After the 3rd of March petition and uh, my appearance in several TV interviews talking about it, a smear and organized campaign started against me in all types of media. At that time, BBM, SMS, uh, dedicated internet sites were established for that purpose, uh, radio talk shows, a newspaper, and that later stage the TV as well. 
Uh, it was definitely orchestrated by the security apparatus in a preparation for my arrest. I was arrested on the 8th of April 2011 amidst uh, death threats and hostile campaign. I spent almost eight months in jail and freed one day after the verdict by presidential pardon on the 28th of November 2011. I was given three years imprisonment and trumped up charges related to assaulting top officials in the country. We were deprived from most of our rights in the jail and the court. After my release, I was fired from my job. My passport was never returned to me until date. Denied obtaining certificate of con good conduct, which is a prerequisite for a new job, and shortly after, I was put as well on travel ban so that I cannot even use my ID to travel to GCC countries. And as I continued my human rights activities, campaigns and threats continued. In September 2012, I was assaulted twice within one week at the university where I was doing my law degree, which I started in 2009. Before being arrested and continued after my arrest, in both, uh, in, both, in both assaults, I obtained medical report and open police cases, none of which resulted in arresting any individuals, any individual. The second attack was severe, and, I, and the attackers used the same method to escape from inside the university. In January 2013, my money that I earned over 12 years of work along with my end of service benefit disappeared from the bank, my bank account in Abu Dhabi. I approached the bank and ended up filing complaint that at later stage transferred to the prosecution to initiate legal action. I was called three weeks after that for interrogation and to provide my feedback. While I was there at the, in the prosecution, they stole my car from the parking lot of the court and prosecution. My car just vanished from the parking lot there. The money and the car amount to about 200,000 US dollars. Neither the money nor the car returned back to me until date, despite me taking legal actions on both cases. They even refused to give me a, an insur a report to claim my car via the insurance. My email and social media accounts were targeted several times and hacked more than once. I'm frequently targeted by sophisticated spywares. For more than a year now, I couldn't get my hotmail back. Hotmail, hotmail people weren't uh, uh, cooperative at all in that, in that sense. On several occasions, I was physically followed, and several other occasions, surveillance cars, cars were roaming or parking uh, close to the building that I live in. And to give you a fresh uh, information that happened uh, uh, recently on the 8th of March, this month, a few days back, the UAE authorities revoked the citizenship of two daughters and the son of one of the detainees whom they previously revoked the citizenship of. These are some, of ty some types of the oppressions that we face here working on the ground as human rights defenders in UAE. Thank you all, thank you. Thank you all for giving me this chance to talk to you. And I wish that we all contribute in making this place and the region a better place for everybody to live in. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we're very glad to have another person here with us uh, who was able to travel and be, be here in Geneva. Um, so next up is, is Roy Donaghy. Uh, Roy is uh, a news editor for Middle East Eye, where he specializes in reporting on the Gulf. Uh, prior to joining uh, Middle East Eye, he co-founded and directed the Emirates Center for Human Rights, which was the first independent organization to focus on uh, rights abuses in the UAE. Uh, so. Rory, please. About a topic that really receives very little uh, attention and uh, also it's great that Ahmed Mansour was able to speak because he's one of them, I've known him for about four years and he's one of the most courageous people I've ever had the, the pleasure of knowing. Um, I'm going to step back a little bit from the personal cases that have been spoken about and try and give a sort of broader picture about, about the UAE 
Um, and before launching into criticism, just it is worth noting that the UAE, since its independence in 1971, has witnessed incredible development until, uh, until today. It's the second biggest economy in the Arab world, behind Saudi Arabia. It's listed as the happiest country in the Arab world, uh, and is home to the leading uh, green industries of Abu Dhabi. Um, but underneath all this, there is, a, there is a rising security state that is being constructed by the de facto leader of the UAE, uh, Abu Dhabi Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Zayed. Um, the most famous trial of political activists in the UAE is, of course, the UAE 94, um, and it was born out of the anger at the 2011 petition that, that Ahmed mentioned. Um, but really, that trial was also rooted in Mohammed bin Zayed's personal hatred of the Muslim Brotherhood, as many of those activists were members or affiliated to Islah, which is like a local reformist group that's li linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, and while the UAE would like to shape its narrative in, in terms of its crackdown on activists to being uh, focusing on Islamist opponents of the government, uh, the reality is that it's obviously it's, it's far, it's far wider than that. Um, the, the UAE 94 trial was featured in forced disappearances, allegations of torture, and was roundly condemned by everyone as being an unfair trial. And many other people have also experienced this in the UAE that, that, that people hear very little about. Um, at the minute, there are 215 political prisoners that have been documented by human rights groups as being in the UAE, and they're from 13 different countries, including Libya, as we, as we heard uh, previously. Um, and the UAE has a population of around 9 million people, but with 90% of that being non-nationals, I think that this would leave the country as having one of the highest per capita rates of political prisoners in the region, if not, if not the world, with such a tiny local population. Um, in terms of the abuses that, that I've uh, learned about in the UAE, I mean, if you step even slightly out of line, uh, you can end up in prison. A, a, a well-known case at least to me, is, is, is of a prominent Arab Spring activist, Iyad al-Baghdadi, who lived and grew up in Dubai his whole life. He was arrested for something slightly out of line uh, that he said on Twitter, which was something about the Arab Spring, I'm not quite sure what it was. He ended up being thrown in prison and was eventually deported to, and he lives in Norway now, a country that he'd never visited, but has, has thankfully given him refugee status. Um, and Nasser bin Ghaith, who was uh, mentioned at the beginning, he has still disappeared. Uh, he's also, it's worth noting that he's an economist and he was a lecturer at the Sorbonne uh, University, the Abu Dhabi campus. He's a, he, he's a very well-known man and he's just disappeared into the black hole of the UAE state prisons. Um, in terms of sort of a, a wider picture on all this, the, the money that has been used, the, the proceeds of oil in Abu Dhabi by Mohammed bin Zayed, he has, he has built a security state that is unrivaled in the region, I think. Uh, the New York Times reported a couple of years ago he has constructed a private army uh, which is manned by Colombian mercenaries uh, and it was uh, set up by Eric Prince who's formerly of the notorious Blackwater Mercenary uh, Army Company. Um, one of the reasons that the New York Times had reported that this army had been set up was to put down any potential civil dissent. Obviously, we haven't seen that yet, but uh, this army is likely being used in Yemen, where the UAE, along with uh, all sides, have been accused of committing uh, crimes. Um, secondly, on the on on security state, Israel and the UAE have, have, have grown a very strong security relationship and this relationship even, is even showing signs of becoming public with uh, the recent appointment of the first Israeli as representative uh, diplomatically to an Arab state in, many, uh, in a long time. And this was to IRENA, the energy agency which is based in Abu Dhabi. There's now an Israeli representative who, who lives there. It's obviously extremely sensitive for the public of the UAE who are broadly very sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. Um, and part of this relationship that people may not know about is that the, the, in Abu Dhabi there is a state surveillance structure called Falcon Eye, which monitors people 24 hours a day, and it's, it's a very sophisticated way of tapping into how people live their lives and predict their movements from street cameras to monitoring your TV, your phone calls, everything. Uh, and this was done through a company called Asia Global Technology, 
which is owned by Matty Kachavi and is really a businessman, and it was used with the, the technological guidance of ex-Mossad uh, intelligence uh, agents. Uh, and all of this must have been done with the approval of Israel, given the sensitivities of the relationship. And, and all of this is open-sourced intelligence, and, and my reporting on this can be easily found on the Middle East Eye uh, website. Um, of course, finally, just sort of moving on, uh, the UAE obviously lives in a dangerous neighbourhood. Uh, there's a lot of violence and problems in the region. Thankfully, the country has has been free of, of any terrorist attacks, but obviously the threat from, from IS uh, remains stark, I would imagine. But the, the state has used this opportunity of fear to to crack down on people who pose no threat to the state. The 2012 cybercrimes decree outlawed the use of the internet for basically any type of criticism of authorities, and that led to the imprisonment of an American citizen, uh, Shezin Kassam, in the end of 2013. He was thrown in prison for a few months because he made a video that made a spoof of life in Dubai where he had been living happily, working for a big company for many years. Um, finally, when Ahmed talked about the 2011 uh, petition, he, he mentioned that he was calling for democratic reforms, and that's because in the UAE it's, an, it's still an authoritarian state of federation of seven emirates, effectively led by Abu Dhabi. Uh, the Federal National Council has 40 seats, 50% of these are elected, and we had elections last year, and in that the number of people elect, uh, who were able to vote did double to I think around a quarter of a million people. Um, but this body still remains uh, completely advisory, it has no legislative authority, which I think is what Ahmed was trying to, to change. Um, and it's worth noting that the UAE, if, if it ever says that democracy is not the aim of its state, which it, it may do, um, you only have to look in its constitution to see that Sheikh Zayed, the much-loved founder of the, the country, put in there that the aim of the country is to build a democracy. So what Ahmed's calling for is simply only what's contained within the constitution itself. Um, but in the UAE there is no truly free civil society uh, at all. No human rights groups can operate freely and people like Ahmed can't even travel, let alone operate. Uh, the only gr uh, human rights group in the country that's allowed to operate freely uh, is the government approved one and it's only pulled out at points like during the UAE 94 trial when there was pressure on torture and they were pulled out to say there was no torture. So that's the, the, that's the human rights uh, environment in the UAE. Um, and just to close, the, the UAE 94 trial killed what was a nascent movement for democracy in the UAE. It's difficult to assess the opposition movement now in the UAE given the climate of fear that surrounds people speaking out. Um, so it, it's, it's very hard to gauge whether anyone still supports Islam or, or wants change, but there must be. Um, but it must be very difficult for them to, to, to voice their opinions. Um, and I would urge, I'm assuming everyone here probably at some point will travel to the UAE and you'll, Dubai can feel very liberal and progressive, or at least it did when I was there before I, I was banned. Um, but beyond the Abu Dhabi and Dubai and, and the glitz of all that, the, in the north there is Emirates like Ras Al Khaimah where there is genuine poverty and it is perhaps from there that, and, and the most Emirati citizens live in Ras Al Khaimah as well as a population. So perhaps it's from there that we may see some future opposition movements emerge. But for now and for the for the long future, people like Ahmed and others will likely end up in prison, possibly tortured and forced into confessions and end up spending years in prison like many of the UAE 94 uh, did in 2013. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rory. Um, and, and I think that this, um, I want to sort of take this opportunity to say, you know, while you know our organization is, uh, you know, we're Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain, uh, you know, we've we've long seen a lot of the the issues that you find in Bahrain, where it's, uh, you know, whether it's abusive counterterror laws to restrict dissent and uh, arbitrary detention, torture, uh, revocation of citizenship, as we, we've seen, uh, you know, a lot of these issues are are shared across the Gulf, and you see a lot of similar issues in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, and so. Uh, you know, this is partly why we work on some of these other countries as well, and that we, uh, and this is why we're, we're glad to be able to have this discussion today, and and to be able to, uh, you know, hear hear about the issues that are are in the UAE, and and how that, uh, you know. When you, when you look at the Gulf, it's not just countries like Saudi Arabia that are, you know, restricting a lot of these rights or, or arbitrarily imprisoning uh, 
uh, people with dissenting views against the government. And so, um, and so we're really glad to have this discussion here on, on the UAE then uh, and, and to, to bring this to, to light in here at the, the Human Rights Council. Um, so now I know that we've got only about 10 minutes left. Um, and so we're going to open up for uh, just brief uh, Q&A. Hi, my name is Omar Farouk Osman. Um, I'm from the National Union of Somali Journalists. Um, yeah, I see the title is state repression. And I come from Somalia where we have a very serious problem and our problem is coming from Middle East, to be honest with you. I'm a journalist. We are most victimized and targeted. Um, and we have had a very serious interest issue, which is particularly with the colleagues sitting uh, you know, on, the, on the right side, because um, there are countries exporting human rights repression to Somalia and creating instability in our country. And uh, you know, as a trade unionist as well, we feel you know, very obliged to talk about when there is a child abuse, when there was, you know, underage, you know, uh, violations. These are very touching for us. And very recently, uh, Iran has become a case for us in Somalia. We have problems with our neighbors, okay. Ethiopia, Kenya, and all this. So uh, again, just with a question as well. What, what do you say about exporting state repression to another country? Okay. That's very important for us. Because we are in a civil war, we are fighting terrorists, and yet, People are exporting us state repression. That's a very important question. Uh, I mean to ask why, why you exaggerate, I mean, about the human rights in Emirates while, I mean, there is no fact of what you're saying. And I saw, I, you should also respect any charge from the court when the court issued charge in any the world. That's what I want to highlight. But what you're saying about the uh, human rights in UAE, I think it's not exist. Thank you. I know that um, earlier earlier this month there was an Amani national who was arrested um, for well I can I can read you the charge uh, disseminating information with a view to ridicule and damage the reputation of state symbols um, on WhatsApp and I wanted to ask maybe Rory you talked a little bit about the Falcon Eye um, what what. Uh, is kind of the monitoring of now not only social media but also getting into people's uh, privacy and, and looking at um, applications like WhatsApp and other forms of communication. Uh, the, the question about the monitoring of uh, uh, apps and mobile communications in the UAE, I think that that's, that's, that's really strong. My, my communication with anyone who's in the UAE has to be done through secure means, and people are very nervous as a result of that. It definitely stifles a lot of people's communications and their ability to form underground networks, for instance, or make any sort of comments. The, the, the arrest of the Omani man, uh, was particularly shocking. I mean, the National, which is like an English language paper that's often referred to, is effectively state-owned, called him an illiterate uh, camel herder. Uh, so trying to just really insult him, I think that's really, that's something to, to, to think about. And in terms of the, the last thing I'd say is just to, to the lady who said that the human rights abuses don't exist in the UAE, we've got a man here who was in prison in the UAE, so I think that's evidence enough for me. Why, why our organization works on a lot of the different GCC countries. We, de we see a lot of the GCC countries uh, sort of exporting their, their types of, of human rights abuses, both just sort of to each other's countries, but as well as more broadly. Uh, we see this, this pattern of really sharing worst practices when it comes to uh, you know, ways to uh, protect human rights. And so, um, and so I, I, I certainly agree with, with uh, that point in, in that way. Um, with that, are there any just final, actually, you know what, looking at the clock here, we're just at 11 and we want to be respectful to the next group. Um, and so with that, I think we're going to conclude. Thank you uh, to all of the co-sponsors of today's event. Thank you to all of my co-panelists here as well, uh, who were able to join us both in person and uh, via uh, distance electronically. So um, thank you all and uh, have a great rest of your day. <laughs>